Ambrose agreed to start cooperating for the FBI as an informant. Frank then spent the ensuing year and a half traveling around the country wearing a wire. He attended various activist gatherings and recorded the happenings there. And he recorded conversations with various former friends and associates about their work as part of the environmental movement above ground or clandestine. In total, he recorded 178 conversations in all, including with his then current wife, Marie Mason, in which he asked her questions about their former activities and she answered. Um, Frank's cooperation was so great, according to the government, that they said that he set a new high mark for cooperation that future informants could look to for inspiration. He had a phone in which he was available 24 hours a day for any question from the FBI, no matter how minor, and he would answer them all. If he would remember any detail, no matter how small, that could help the government in their investigation, he would call them and volunteer it to them. The government was, of course, thrilled. However, the damage done to the environmental movement, as well as Marie and her family, is untold. In February 2008, Marie's then 16-year-old daughter caught an FBI agent trying to place a GPS tracking device under Marie's car. On March 10th, a couple of weeks later, Marie was arrested by federal agents. Frank filed divorce papers the day she got arrested. An act of domestic terrorism. That's what investigators are calling an arson on the campus of Michigan State University. Tonight, arrests in the eight-year-old case, a federal indictment against members of a radical environmental group. Fox 17's Lisa Plant has our story. As many celebrated New Year's Eve before Y2K, this was the scene on the Michigan State University campus. Before the clock struck midnight, someone set fire to the offices in Agriculture Hall. We had determined that that fire was, in fact, an arson case, which resulted in a loss to Michigan State University of over a million dollars. No one was hurt, but research documents and computers were destroyed. Scientists had been doing plant genetics research in the building. Members of the Earth Liberation Front, ELF, claimed responsibility. It's a group that's been linked to arsons to stop research or commercial growth that they consider harmful to the environment. An act of domestic terrorism, plain and simple. There's no two ways about it. The use of violence and the destruction of property to make a political statement cannot be tolerated in a civilized society. In this grand jury indictment, an unnamed person admits he or she worked with the group who started the fire. The informant names Marie Mason, 46, of Cincinnati, Ohio, Frank Ambrose, 33, of Detroit, Aaron Berthwick, 27, of Detroit, and Stephanie Fultz, 27, of Detroit. They're charged with four counts from aggravated arson to conspiracy. The same group claimed it also damaged logging equipment and a flatbed truck near Mesick, about 100 miles north of Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. There's a media story at the time. Marie, as the video says, was charged with involvement with the December 1999 arson at a Michigan State University plant genetics laboratory at Agriculture Hall, as well as a January 2000 arson of logging equipment in Mesick, Michigan. Both arsons were claimed by the Earth Liberation Front. As a bit of background, the burning of MSU's Agriculture Hall was a significant act, and one that was bound to be targeted for response as part of the Green Scare repression. As former ELF press officer Craig Rosebrow explains, not only was the damage quite significant, but this was the first time arson had been used to further the cause against genetic engineering in the United States. Furthermore, it was the first time the ELF had taken credit for any GE-related action. The media at the time presented the action as an assault on scientific efforts to relieve famine in the developing world. But as the ELF communique stated, MSU's research was funded by the U.S. government and corporations like Monsanto, which would then use their power to force these crops on desperate nations. These nations often resist the importation of GE crops and seeds, given their significant risks to human health, cultural identity, biological diversity, and ecological integrity. Marie had been passionate about the issue of GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and genetic engineering in general, since she had taken a trip to India in the late 1990s. During this trip, she met with indigenous farmers there, who described to her the ways that genetic engineering was affecting their way of life. They said that Monsanto's work in particular, particularly around terminator seeds, prevented them from saving seeds for the next season and forced them to continue giving money to Monsanto every year, therefore threatening their food supply and their traditional way of life. Marie was so affected by the words of these farmers that she decided that genetic engineering was a really big problem and that it needed to be stopped, not only because of its effects on human health and the environment, but of its effects on people. When she got home, she did some research into genetic engineering 
and found out where Monsanto was doing their research, which traced her back to MSU. She wanted to stop these things because she cared about them deeply. When Marie got charged, she was facing life in prison. And the, ev and the evidence was damaging because of Frank's cooperation, who had, after all, recorded conversations with her about this stuff. Knowing this, she chose to take a plea agreement, admitting to her involvement in the two actions she had been charged with. She also admitted involvement in 12 other actions. The thought we had to make real small, so they would all fit on one slide. In total, Marie admitted involvement in 14 actions, 13 of which were claimed by the Earth Liberation Front, one by the Animal Liberation Front, and combined did over $2.5 million worth of damage. Not a single action she committed hurt another living being. What would lead or motivate somebody to do these things? Marie had expressed before that the tactics that activists had been trying to stop the destruction of the environment had merely slowed down the progress of destruction rather than stopping it. Marie is a practical person, was back then, still is. She wanted to do what worked, whatever it is that looked like. If she thought that public organizing and education would be the thing that would stop these things, she wanted to do that. If she thought that things needed to be stopped in a more immediate and direct way, that was what she ended up doing too. Now, Marie didn't want to name anyone when she took her plea agreement. She didn't want to cooperate with the state at all. However, the state said that they wouldn't give her a plea agreement if she didn't. So she chose to confirm, her in confirm what Frank said about the two of their involvement and name him. Nevertheless, the government, despite trying to do this to try to destroy her support base, used her lack of cooperation against her. They tried to make an example of her for doing what she needed to do, for refusing to play by their rules, for staying strong from start to finish. They also used things against her, such as her links to younger activists and various environmental campaigns going on at the time, such as the campaign against I-69, the highway going through Indiana. At the same time, the government was repressing activists involved in that campaign. They were literally attempting to criminalize the creation of links between movements and bringing people together. Part of Marie's plea agreement stipulated that she had to accept the terrorism enhancement designation, like Eric, which provides for broad discretion in sentencing. The judge was able to consider the 12 other actions Marie admitted to, but was not being charged with, for the purpose of her sentencing. At her sentencing in February 2009, the prosecution recommended that she be sentenced to 15 to 20 years. The judge gave her more, 21 years, 10 months. The judge gave her extra time for violating the marketplace of ideas. I'll read you the quote from the judge. It gets better, if you can call it that. The judge says, Terrorist acts attack societal norms. In this case, the defendant took license, based on her ideological views, to elevate her grievances over the norms of civilized society. On that last point, I want to reflect on what this case is not about. This case is not about a prosecution for holding political viewpoints. Freedom of expression is guaranteed by our Constitution, and our society is dedicated to the proposition that the marketplace of ideas exists to facilitate that free expression. But this case is about an abandonment of the marketplace of ideas in favor of reckless criminal activity where intimidation and fear replace persuasion and dialogue. Despite the judge's statement that her case is not about a prosecution for holding political viewpoints, it's clear that exactly the opposite is true. Marie was given almost 22 years in prison for two acts of property destruction in which no one was injured or killed. This was precisely because she was an environmental activist whose actions disrupted the marketplace. The average sentence for murder in federal court is 22 years. The average sentence for arson is seven. Marie Mason is now serving the longest prison sentence of any environmental activist in the United States. And she remains strong. At first, when she went to prison, she went to a medium security prison in Waseca, Minnesota. She went in as an organizer. As a community organizer for years, this was what she wanted to continue to do. And she organized various things in prison. She started a poetry writing group, taught her fellow inmates English, taught them how to play guitar, started a band called Razor Wire. There's their picture. Um, started a Buddhist reading group. Uh, did various other things, made a lot of friends there, did well, did, was about a, as effective an organizer within the prison as you could be in those situations. This, of course, was intolerable to the government, who moved Marie in August of 2010 to a special wing of Carswell Prison in Texas that has restrictive policies regarding communication that are similar to communications management units, CMUs, although not quite as severe. There are 20 women in Marie's unit. Their death row and people considered disciplinary problems 
Other political prisoners, like Lynn Stewart, are also housed there. Marie has restrictions on visits, who can visit, um, until very recently, like a couple of days ago, only immediate family and one friend were allowed to come visit her there. She has restrictions on phone calls, how many she can make, who she can make them to, and she has restrictions on mail. She can get mail, but she has a short pre-approved list of who she can write back to. So if you've ever written Marie a letter, which I highly recommend doing, and haven't gotten a letter back, that might be why. They're trying their best to isolate her as much as possible. Why are they doing this? They're trying to disappear her, to keep her from organizing and from being effective in any possible way. We can't let them do this. She is still our comrade, still a part of our movements, a part of us. And in turn, we can learn from her and her examples. Marie doesn't care about herself, she said this, about her legal situation or what's going on with her. She cares about us, about the struggles that she's a part of, and about what's going on in the world. So what's up with Frank? What happened to him? Frank Ambrose got nine years in prison, and his damage keeps going on. His testimony led to harassment of Marie's family. Based on his testimony, Marie's son was later arrested for a misdemeanor charge dating back to when he was a teenager. After Marie's arrest, the FBI raided Marie's mother's house, seized private papers from her teenage daughter, intimidated an ex-partner at his workplace, and harassed her supporters. There's also continuing prosecutions happening around the Midwest for environmental activity in the earlier part of the 2000s, particularly around Earth Liberation Front activity. After a long period of inactivity, 10 sealed documents were recently filed on Frank Ambrose's docket. These sudden secret filings on the docket that are confirmed informant are cause for concern, although it's unclear what to make of it. What is disturbing is that they're occurring of the context, in the context of these continuing prosecutions. The most recent of these was against David Agronoff, who agreed to cooperate by attempting to provide substantial assistance to the government. Agronoff, who went to federal prison for a year this January for his involvement in one of the actions, Kreider and Kreider vandalism, that Marie and Frank admitted their involvement in, claimed through his lawyer that he only cooperated against Frank and Marie, and that he didn't tell the government anything they didn't already know. To say the least, we are not convinced that this is true. Agronoff's plea agreement, indictment, and other documents have been removed from his docket, so we don't know exactly what they say. We do know that his name shows up in other people's paperwork. In the last year, multiple indictments for actions that occurred in the Midwest over a decade ago have come to light. The first was the indictment of an individual named Jesse Waters for conspiracy with Marie and Frank, connection, connected to the destruction of logging equipment in Misek that they were charged with. The indictment was originally filed and sealed in 2009. It was unsealed in 2011 because the government said that a significant cooperating human source, an informant in his case, would be testifying in another trial. Since he would be testifying in this trial, he would no longer be useful as an informant, and therefore the indictment his, could be unsealed because his identity would be revealed. The second indictment, and the trial in question, was that of Daniel Kruk, who was being charged with carrying out an arson at the headquarters of the Indiana Republican Party in Bloomington on September 9, 2000. The indictment mentions, but does not name or charge, another person known to the grand jury. Dan Kruk's trial was set for the same day as the trial mentioned in the indictment of Waters. It would seem that the same informant is being used in both of these cases. At the time the Waters indictment was originally filed in 2009, this informant was actively assisting the government in other arson investigations in numerous federal districts. Jesse Waters was recently sentenced to six months. Daniel Kruk's case has not been settled yet. At, the time, at this time, the identity of the informant in these cases is still unknown, although it appears from the legal documents in those cases that the informant is not Frank, or at least he's not the only one. The court documents seem to indicate that the informant in those cases is male and was involved in actions that took place in Michigan and Indiana in 2000, although there might be more. It is also unknown what other, if any, cases they have been involved in. Recently, Daniel Kruk's lawyer filed a motion that the government filed a motion to seal. The government says that these paperwork, um, if they were continued to be unsealed, would reveal um, information that would compromise ongoing investigations by the government, and therefore they needed to remain under seal so that whatever the government wants to keep secret could be kept secret. The following day, Dan Kruk's defense filed a response to the government's motion, saying there was nothing in there that wasn't already on the internet, that, and they provided a link to a site called War on Society that said that David Agronoff was a snitch. They said, everybody knows that this person's a snitch. It's on the internet already. What does this mean? We're not sure. I will say that we don't, we don't know the extent of Agronoff's involvement 
or how far this stuff is going to go. We don't know who this informant is. We don't know, really, I don't know. We, don't, we do know that this stuff probably isn't over, and we want to warn you all, be safe. Don't talk to the cops if they come and harass you, and support the future prisoners they may be become, assuming that they're not cooperating. If they're cooperating, fuck them. <laughs> As for Marie, she, like Eric, lost her last appeal attempt. And like Eric, um, you know, she has similar options at this point. Commutation of sentence, a presidential pardon. Again, we can maybe see how likely this might be. At this point, we're thinking that we need to think beyond the legal system, to think about what we can do for her and other long-term prisoners. We need to support her, write her letters. Um, you can find her address on her website, supportmariemason.org. We can raise funds for her so that she can get the things that she needs to keep in touch with her family and the things that she needs to survive in prison. Um, but we don't want to just support her. She's expressed that she doesn't just want support. She wants solidarity. What can that look like? It can look like continuing the struggles that she was a part of. And we have some other ideas later. And how is Marie doing? Despite the governments doing their best to try to break her spirit, she's still strong. I want to read a quote from her, um, written earlier this year on the eve of her 50th birthday. Marie says, tomorrow I will turn 50. It's a mile marker and a time to reflect on my life. Like all humans, I've made mistakes and have some small regrets. But I am still an anarchist, a feminist, an internationalist, a wildly and community organizer, a passionate earth burster, and I am still proud to have played my part in the Earth Liberation Front and Animal Liberation Front's work to defend the wild and our non-human brothers and sisters. My life has been spent in many movements, and all seem to be part of the process of necessary change. That experiment in social change is still ongoing, and we must all keep trying, keep contributing what we can. My body is trapped here, but my heart is with you still fighting out there. <coughs> never give up. Never give in. Keep your minds open to inventing better, compassionate ways to make change happen. And right when you can. I'm a mom. I worry about all of you out there. <laughs> I want to end with a video from Vandana Shiva, who's an activist in India against GMOs and for the rights of farmers and traditional ways of life there. I pay tribute to Mary Mason for what she did to keep our food system, our agriculture environment free of GMOs. I think it is criminal that she's been treated like a criminal and that is why we need a movement both for the rights of nature and the rights of the defenders of nature so that they can get along with their work to protect this beautiful planet and our common freedoms. she actually did something about the atrocities she saw happen around her. Because of that, she got 22 years in prison. Eric matters because even though he had not taken any action, he merely talked about it, he still got 20 years in prison. Interesting security culture lesson, don't talk unless you're actually going to do something. And don't do something unless you're ready for nearly 20 years in prison. And if you are going to do something, be damn careful about who you talk to and involve. And they both matter because they are our comrades. Their struggle was our struggle before their incarceration, and it remains so. They have both displayed amazing integrity in the face of fierce repression, remain true to themselves and the ideals they fight for. Prisoner support, wait, yes. Prisoner support is important for prisoners because it gives them the emotional and material support they need to endure, to endure years of isolation, locked away from the people and the struggles they care so much about. It reminds them they are not alone, and that people out here are fighting for them and ready to welcome them with open arms on their return. It's important to us because we have friends, partners, and loved ones locked away in prison. Because when someone gets kidnapped by the state, it doesn't just affect them, but their entire communities. The fact that their imprisonment is woven to every moment of our day. Without them, we are missing pieces of our hearts. And it's important to our movements and struggles because these are the folks who have put their bodies on the line for the very things we're all fighting for. They are what gives our struggles the teeth and momentum it needs. They remind us of what's possible. It is also important to our movements for other more practical reasons. When people don't feel supported by their communities, 
they are much more likely to flip upon our rests and cooperate with the government. What they did matters to us and the state, or otherwise their sentences wouldn't be so drastically long. It matters to us because it reminds us that we don't have to wait for permission to do what we know is right. It matters to us because it reminds us we are not powerless. And it matters to us because, like Marie and Eric, we are sick and tired of seeing all that we love be destroyed by all that we hate. Thank you. So this is the part where we pass this Easter basket thing. <laughs> um, we are asking a suggested donation of five to fifteen dollars uh, for our presentation. Um, beyond uh, such things, expenses of gas, all the proceeds are going to split evenly between Eric and Marie's support. Um, we also have zines and t-shirts and CDs and posters back there, which we will, one of us will go back there bottom after the show, after the presentation, and uh, get back to the talk to you. <laughs> and at the moment, while, the, while this little basket's being passed around, Leslie's going to join us to uh, talk about Marie and personal experiences with her. Hey, um, so for everyone who doesn't already know, I'm Leslie, um, and coincidentally or not, um, I and one other person, Craig, who was quoted earlier, uh, were the spokespeople for a group that was called the Earth Liberation Front Press Office. Um, what we did was set up a sort of media liaison so that the underground people in the Earth Liberation Front could pass their messages onto us, and then we could just step forward and openly speak in support of what they were doing and not risk, be risking arrest because you know if you go and you burn down a building and then you go and talk to the news about it the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to go to prison immediately so we were kind of um, modeling after a number of different efforts that had happened in previous generations um, to sort of build a network to get communication out to um, the rest of the movement and the rest of the general public about why why people were committing you know illegal guerrilla actions um, and why it was important and, and what they were all about, and um, it was a challenging, challenging thing. But it was well, it was really, it was really worth it. Um, it was really important. So anyway, um, I'm gonna try not to repeat too much of what had happened, um, but I do have a little bit to add. Um, this is a communique that uh, I received from. I didn't know it at the time, but um, Marie and I guess Frank and others um, claiming responsibility for the MSU action against Monsanto and USAID at uh, Michigan State University. December 31st, 1999. The ELF takes credit for a strike on the offices of Catherine Ives, room 324 at Agriculture Hall at Michigan State University. The offices were doused with gasoline and set afire. This was done in response to the work that's being done to force developing nations in Asia, Latin America, and Africa to switch from natural crop plants to genetically engineered sweet potatoes, corn, potatoes, I'm sorry, bananas, and pineapples. Monsanto and USAID are major funders of the research and promotional work being done through Michigan State University. Cremate Monsanto, long live the ELF. On to the next GE target. Um, as was mentioned earlier, that was the first Earth Liberation Front action that was taken against genetic engineering. Um, and it was a significant action. It, it, it broke the, it, the sentencing. It, during the plea agreement, I believe they ended up saying it was $1.1 million in damage um, that was done. And at that point, as we were um, kind of measuring the successive actions that we did through the press office, we were always kind of hoping that actions would hit the $1 million mark. There's just, there was something in the press and the media and the public uh, opinion that if you caused a million dollars of damage, it was really significant. If it was less than that, it didn't quite get as much play. So um, there were a number of things that were really significant about that MSU action. Um, and, and to give a little bit more background, before that, there were other guerrilla underground actions that were taken for um, the issue of genetic engineering. but. They, in the U.S. at least, had, had consisted of crop destructions, which were people who would go onto fields, you know, they might have to jump a fence or something, but they basically go into a field and they, they clear the crops down, and then, you know, they, 
come up with the kind of like clever, witty little names for their groups. Uh, Bolt Weevils, or I don't know, there were just so many of them, these like ad hoc groups that would just commit these crop destructions and claim them um, through communiques. And, uh, and we got some of those communiques and handled that work as well. But um, it's, it's a, and we were excited about all that. That's great work. We're excited about all that. But it was a totally different game when you're talking about a um, million plus dollar arson at a public facility funded by a government agency and a major multinational corporation. So um, the MSU action, it was, it was a very big and significant, significant thing. But as was also pointed out earlier, um, Marie was, it, it, in, her, in her case, admitted to a dozen, roughly, maybe, maybe 13, I can't 14. 14 total. Yeah, um, actions that were focused against mainly deforestation and development um, in various ways. And, and a number of those actions were, were really significant and inspirational as well. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a personal experience because I actually knew Marie. Um, try to explain a little bit how these things were significant. So after the MSU action, almost immediately, we've been dealing with 60 Minutes, which is, um, if you're not familiar, it's like a major news magazine show that back when TV was before internet, that was like the way to get your news, and still is for a lot of people. But 60 Minutes is a bit, kind of a big deal in that world. So uh, they've been calling us and like, you know, toying with the idea of doing a story, and we were hoping for that, because that's our job, trying to get as much exposure as possible. So. Um, you know, they kept in contact with her, but they weren't quite moving, they were waiting for something to move on. And, on. and so then after the MSU action, they immediately jumped. They were like, oh, this is, it's time to do the 60 minutes piece. Like, we're going to come out there, like, right now. Um, and so that was a breaking point because we were in Oregon and um, learning, just, just flying by the seat of our pants, and so we didn't know how a lot of this stuff worked. And, and most of these actions were happening in the Pacific Northwest. And so there are these different media markets I found out, you know, that are centered in different places, the big ones being LA and New York. Um, and we finally broke out of the Northwest, like, small-time media market and got into the LA and it sort of got West Coast exposure for ELF stuff because the actions got big enough and we were able to make enough contacts and make that happen. And then we finally, after even more effort, made it into the New York media market. So then after that, all those actions got a whole lot more exposure. Because once we could build relationships with some of these people, they would follow up on actions even if they weren't major because it was an ongoing story. But you had to do something in the first place to make them pay attention, which is why all these buildings got burnt down in part. That's part of the reason why. So um, getting onto 60 Minutes was a big deal um, for whatever it was worth. And in addition to that, right after the MSU action, um, Frontline PBS contacted us. And Frontline is like a major uh, sort of television documentary series, an ongoing thing. They did an hour long, I think it was an hour, maybe two hours, I can't remember exactly. It was a special just on genetic engineering. It was, it was called Harvest of Fear. You know, and it, was what, it was what it was. All these programs are what they are. You know, you can't get a whole lot of good through the mainstream corporate media. But it was a major accomplishment. It was shown not just in the US, but you know, syndicated out through Europe and a lot of other places. And, um, and it had a segment in there just on the MSU action. Um, and just on the militancy of the, of the uh, anti-genetic engineering movement and um, focused some on uh, international stuff as well that was happening in that movement, which was excellent, um, even if it wasn't always sympathetic. Um, on January 31st, um, there was another action that happened, which was just, what, like a month exactly after the MSU action? Which was uh, the first time the Earth Liberation Front claimed responsibility for luxury housing development, arson. So this is a scenario where you've got some pristine you know, piece of nature, usually on a watershed for some weird reason, where rich people come in and they want to build their, in this case, $1.5 million house on it, um, which of course is not only taking that piece of wilderness away from all the, you know, everyone, all the creatures and everything that lives there, but all of us. Uh, who drink water from that watershed is, you know, getting run off of these people. And so, um, it was the first time that that had happened, and it was a totally different move. In addition to the, the genetic engineering move that they, that they had made, this action against, this first action against luxury housing development was also a first for the ELF. Um, and it's just one of the ones that we admitted. Uh, go for it. Um, 
it opened up a, there's this weird thing called Core TV, or was, I don't know if there is anymore, where there's like this weird TV, cable TV station where they just talk about legal issues all the time, and they have these like ongoing debates, kind of like you might have seen Malcolm X doing back in the 60s, you know, that doesn't exist anymore, we have these like actually in-depth like ongoing debates on television, so they were trying to do that kind of thing about legal issues, and so they had Craig, who I worked with at the press office, um, and uh, the, the future owner of this how this home that was being built, more or less duke it out on this show. It's kind of rough at times, but what it did that was really productive in my opinion was it, it really opened up the debate on how these issues aren't just about the environment, they're about class and they're about um, economics and power. And, and so, you know, when you've got somebody who's got all this money in the world and they want to make their little Disneyland, on the backs of everyone else, you know, th these types of politics get started to get expressed, not just in through the press office, but also through other communiques and future actions. You started to see a lot more um, mention about class and mention about power and wealth and economics and, and that kind of analysis represented by the the British Prime Minister. That thought was really significant, even if that action didn't really end up being one of the most famous that they ever did. Um, and also, they were. Maria, if you look at what Maria has admitted guilt to, there were a number of sort of things happening in this region and right around Bloomington, Indiana in particular. And so, uh, um, I, I can't remember, they, they, they made a forum, and it was called, I have it written down here, public forum that they had in Bloomington at a Unitarian church, and it was called, uh, Direct action, violence, or self-defense. And they invited the press office, me and Craig, uh, to come out there and um, and participate in this public forum. There was a former FBI agent, um, and there was also a representative of political science or something like that from the local university. And um, you know, I probably would have was thinking it was probably something about this size when I was on my way out there to go do it. But um, actually, there was a lot of community, a surprising amount of community interest in this because of. Um, you know, all the actions that have been happening and how they were big news locally. And so, uh, the mayor made a move where he decided to publicly announce that people shouldn't go to this thing. That by going